Hello and welcome to this section of the Trig and Precalculus Tutor. Here we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about what we call the Pythagorean identities. Right? Sounds very complicated, but I promise you that uh, it's not complicated. And in fact, it's some of the most useful identities um, that are available in Trig and Precalculus. So in truth, what I consider to be the most important identities, the ones that you have to know, are the ones that we learned in the first couple of sections, those fundamental ones with the trig rainbow. These guys rank right up underneath. I mean, they are so important that you'll use them constantly over and over and over again. And when I mean use them, I mean not just in your class. I mean when you get into more advanced subjects, you'll use them all the time. They pop up. Eventually, we'll get to some identities that are less used. But these guys here are used a lot. So I'm going to take a few minutes to show you where they come from because I think it's very important and that way you're not just like given these identities and saying, well, I'll just memorize them. Well, at least you'll kind of know where they come from. So we call them Pythagorean. All of you should have remembered or should remember the Pythagorean theorem. So let's kind of review that for a second. And you'll see that this identity or these identities come basically straight from it. So if you have a triangle, uh, and not just any triangle, a right triangle with 90 degrees there, and you have one side called A and one side called B, and the longest side we call C, that's the hypotenuse, right? Then you should all remember from basic you know, algebra or geometry or whatever, that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So it's the two shorter sides, you square them, and you set that equal to the longer or the longest side squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. All right, now let me go and kind of draw a little line here. So we're going to use that in a minute. Now, if you think about, stop thinking so much in terms of triangles, think about the unit circle. So let me draw a unit circle here unit circle. We use all the time in trig and precalculus. You should know that by now, right? And when we say unit circle, it just means it has a distance or a radius of one. So I'm going to put ones everywhere just so you kind of get reminded that we're talking about a, a circle with radius one. So let me go ahead and draw. Here's the circle and you have to apologize. I apologize in advance. This kind of looks more like an ellipse, right? It's not a perfect circle. So you have to kind of use your imagination and say, well, that's, that's a circle. All right. So then let's take any random angle, right? So here from the origin, we'll draw something up to the unit circle like this, and we'll put some angle there, right? So this specific angle doesn't matter. It can be anywhere, right? I'm just drawing a specific example to show you, right? How do we define sine and cosine, right? How do we define sine and cosine in general? Well, we have talked about that a lot. A lot. If you take the projection of whatever this is and project it along the x-axis like this, we call that sine, oh, I'm sorry, not sine, we call that cosine of theta. That's the definition of what a cosine is. Anytime you take something that goes up to a unit circle at whatever angle and you take the projection along the x-axis, we call that cosine. And then we take the projection along the y-axis, the distance that it goes up in y, we call that sine of theta. That is simply the definition of what sine and cosine is. No matter what angle you're at, the sine is defined to be the projection along the y-axis and the cosine is defined to be the projection along the x-axis. So as you walk around the unit circle, the sine and the cosine are going to change because the projection along these axes are going to change the whole way around. But don't forget, this is a unit circle. And that means that this side, if you kind of think of this as a triangle, right? That's kind of where we're going here. This is a triangle. This leg, we call it sine theta. This leg, we call it cosine theta. What would this leg be? Well, this is the hypotenuse. It goes all the way to the unit circle. That leg's always going to have a, a distance of one. So no matter what angle this guy is pointed around the unit circle, the distance of this leg is always one because it's always touching the unit circle. The sines and the cosines are going to change, of course, as, as we move around, but the hypotenuse is going to be this guy. So the Pythagorean theorem, it applies to all right triangles, all right triangles. All we've done is we've put a right triangle, you know, I haven't really shown you, but this has got to be right angle here. We put this right triangle inside of a circle. So you can kind of erase the circle and erase the coordinate axis if you want, but it's still a right triangle. So much like what we've wrote, written here, what we have now is sine squared of theta plus this leg, cosine squared theta, is equal to the hypotenuse squared, c squared. But since it's 1, 1 squared, it's just 1, right? This is the fundamental Pythagorean identity. 
sine square, which is the leg of this triangle, plus cosine square, which is the angle, uh, the length of this part of the triangle, they correspond exactly to these legs up here, just like we write for any triangle. The hypotenuse is always one for a unit circle, so we just have a number there. So this is very, very important. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. Now let me make sure, absolutely sure, you understand how to use this. What it means is, for any angle, now you can kind of erase this from your mind. This is the actual identity that we're going to memorize, that you're going to memorize because you're going to use it so much. What it means is, for any angle, take 45 degrees, or whatever, pi over four radians, pi over three radians, it doesn't matter, whatever angle you put in here, the same angle in both spots. You put it in here and you get the sign of that number. When you write the square like this, like, like right here, let me go in over here and say that sine squared theta, this is the same thing as writing sine of theta and you take the quantity and you square it. That's what this means. When you put the square in between the sine and the theta, it's a shorthand way of saying sine theta, take the answer and square it. So if you go in your calculator and put like 45 degrees here or pi over four radians here, and you take the, take the sine, you're gonna get a number. And then you take the, the result and you square it. That's what we're doing here. So we take the angle, we take the sine, then we square it. Okay, then we take the same angle, pi over four, if that's, if that's what we're working with. The same angle that we did here. We take the cosine and then we square that. And we take these two quantities and we add them together you'll always get one. That's what that means. That's why it's such an important identity. It doesn't matter what angle you're working with, 224.359 degrees, or pi over 69 radians. It doesn't matter what angle. If you take pi over 69 radians and take the sine of it, and then you square that answer, and take pi over 69 radians and take cosine, and then you square that answer, and you add the two things that you just got, you will always get one. Always, always, always. It's always true. That's why it's a fundamental Pythagorean identity. The reason it's always true, it's kind of why I wanted to show you this, is because it comes directly from this unit circle. It comes directly from the fact that this Pythagorean theorem is always true. And since sines and cosines are always defined in terms of triangles, that's why this falls out, right? But what you'll find is lots of times when you're dealing with an identity or solving some trig equation or something, you might have a sine squared running around, right? You might have a sine squared running around. And it might be useful to take this and move it over here and solve for sine squared and then do a substitution to use this, this Pythagorean identity in the solution of a problem. Okay, so this is what I want you to remember. Now let me kind of draw a little divider here. Let me derive another identity that comes from that one, from the one we already have. Uh, which is also extremely very, very useful. So let me rewrite what we, what we know. Let me switch colors here. What we know is that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. We always know this to be true. Now this is an equation. I can do whatever I want to the left and to the right hand side as long as I do it to the left and to the right. So let me go and divide both sides of this equation by cosine squared. So if I do that, what I'm going to have is sine squared theta over cosine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta is equal to one over cosine squared theta. Make sure you understand that. All we did is divide both sides. The left-hand side I divide by cosine squared. Uh, you have a big thing over here, but you can split it up because on the bottom you're gonna have cosine squared if you, if you divide the left-hand side by cosine squared. So we get sine squared over cosine squared here, we get this here, we're dividing every term by cosine squared. All right, so let's simplify this a little bit. Uh, what we have here, when you think about it, since we have sine squared on the top and cosine squared on the bottom, this is like sine theta over cosine theta quantity squared. Here, cosine squared over cosine squared is one. And here, this is one over cosine theta squared. The reason I'm writing it like this is just to kind of help me in the next step. You can leave it like this, but you know, when you have something squared on the top and something squared on the bottom, you can kind of take the square out and kind of keep everything inside because when you think about going backwards from the rules of algebra, the square is gonna to apply to the top and the square is gonna to apply to the bottom, which is what we started with. The square here is gonna to apply to the top, which is just one. The square here is gonna to apply to the bottom. So I've done nothing. All I've done is kind of pull the squares out because of the following step. What is sine of a cosine? Sine of a cosine is tangent. So really what I'm gonna have on the inside of this parenthesis is tangent, but since it's squared, I'm gonna write it as tangent squared theta. 
plus 1 is equal to. What do we have here? 1 over cosine. This is a great example uh, of, of, of wanting to use the trig rainbow, but you can't really remember, like, what is 1 over cosine? So this is what I do. Uh, literally, I say sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. I write this on my paper just like this, and I say 1 over cosine. Cosine goes with this one. It must be 1 over or 1 over cosine must be secant. So secant theta, and of course it's squared. So, you know, cosine is 1 over secant. Secant is 1 over cosine. They go back and forth. So that's why the trig rainbow is so helpful. So you didn't have to look in a book. You just remember this, and you can, you can apply it. So this is the second one that are, that's very, very important. It looks very, very different, but it's the same thing. You start with a Pythagorean guy, and you can divide and manipulate in the way that we've done here. This is very important. Tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. That is, that is one that you're going to be using a lot. So what I'd like to do now, since we want to work some problems here in just a few minutes, is I want to rewrite these Pythagorean uh, identities on the board here. So the most funda one, fundamental one is sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. This is always true. Here we have tangent squared plus 1. The way I actually like to remember it is 1 plus tangent squared theta is secant squared theta. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. You know, when you think about it, that's not too hard to remember. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. And also, if you start with this guy, see here we divided by cosine, and then we simplified everything. If you divide by sine, right, divide by sine, divide by sine, divide by sine, or I should say sine squared, divide by sine squared, divide by sine squared, divide by sine squared. If you do the same kind of simplification, you'll arrive at a different result that'll look very similar. 1 plus cotangent squared, is equal to cosecant squared. 1 plus cotangent is cosecant squared. These are what we call the Pythagorean trig identities. Now really, if you really want to be a stickler, the fundamental one, the one that's really the most fundamental, really is the top one because these other ones really come from the top one. We, we get them by manipulating the top one, by dividing and simplifying, right? The only reason I showed you that over there really is to kind of enrich your learning and to kind of show you that these things don't just come out of thin air. This Pythagorean identity comes from something you know, the Pythagorean theorem. And that these other guys, they come from something you know, they come from something up at the top of the board, right? So. I won't do that for all of the identities. I won't go and try to prove all these identities because at some point you just need to kind of accept that other mathematicians and other, you know, uh, very, very smart people before us have proven a lot of these identities are true and we kind of just need to use them to solve our problems and kind of go, go forward and um, use the knowledge given before us to kind of move forward. But with some of them, it's just too irresistible to show you where they come from and these are, these kind of falls in that category for me. So these are the fundamental Pythagorean identities. You will use them a lot. And if you say them, you know, over and over again, you know, sine squared plus cosine squared is one. One plus tangent squared is secant squared, and so on. If you say them a few times, I promise you that you will remember them. Uh, and, and you will use them quite a bit in lots and lots of different kinds of problems. So what I'm going to do is leave these on the board, erase this half of the board, and we'll start to solve some problems, to solve some identities, to show you how to use uh, these Pythagorean identities to actually solve practical problems.